So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our panel on generative AI and fundamental rights. And uh, let me first of all introduce myself, uh, the members of the panel, and then we'll kick off. One thing I just want to say at the outset, though, is I'm not a fan of leading, leaving audience participation until the end. Uh, so if you came for a quiet rest for 45 minutes uh, before joining the Q&A session, you are in the wrong place and you need to leave now. And uh, no offense will be taken. Uh, so I would like your attention. I would like you to enter into the discussion. And we'll be trying to take questions from you throughout the discussion so that you can be an active participant. Uh, I'm James Arroyo. I'm director of the Ditchley Foundation in the UK. Uh, Ditchley tries to address complex problems by bringing people with the right kind of influence and expertise together to, to reflect and to think about strategy. We do geopolitics, we do climate, we do a lot on technology, and I view this as one of the most important subjects we're addressing today. Uh, we've invented something new, uh, potentially wonderful, also potentially dangerous, and we need to think about it deeply even as we move forward, inevitably, I think, quite quickly. Let me turn to members of the panel. We have uh, sitting next to me, uh, Leonardo Navas uh, Thevera, uh, director at the uh, European Data Protection Service, Leonardo. We then have uh, Karolina Mozovic. Uh, I mangled the name despite Karolina's uh, uh, tuition, I know but she will correct me, uh, who is Deputy Head for Data Protection at the European Commission. Then we have Julie Brill, Corporate Vice President and Chief Privacy Officer at Microsoft. And Microsoft, as you know, organized this panel. And on the screen above me, I hope we can see her very shortly, is Deirdre Mulligan, uh, Deputy Chief Technology Officer for Policy at the White House, joining us from DC. So let's get started. This in, these incredible advances uh, have happened on large language model, AI, generative AI, call it what you will. We all know what we mean by that, but we don't fully understand what it means. Deirdre, let's start with, with you as you're online. I, I'm gonna turn to each members of the panel in turn, but for all of you, you know, what excites you about this moment? What do you think it means for good? And what scares you? What do you think we need to pause on? What do we need to reflect on? And then we'll get into some, some more detailed questions, uh, going to each member of the panel in turn and, and expanding a, a discussion. Deirdre, over to you, first of all. Uh, OK, thank you so much for including me in this expert panel. Um, and for the thoughtful and thought-provoking setup you provided in the panel description. As you mentioned, I serve in the office of the U.S. Chief Technology Officer, which is part of the White House um, Office of Science and Technology Policy. Our office advises President Biden and others at the White House and the federal government on how to make technology and technology policy that work for the American people. We advise on everything from improving accessibility of government technology to advancing equity and privacy in the use of data to getting more Americans connected to the internet. We're home to the chief data scientists of the United States and importantly for this moment, the National AI Initiative Office, which coordinates key activities and strategic planning on AI across the US government. So, you know, we were asked to kind of talk about how the White House sees this technology. Is it a huge breakthrough or a huge risk? And President Biden has been very clear that AI is both one of the most powerful tools of our time. And in order to seize the opportunities and the possibilities, which he likes to speak about, we must first mitigate its risks. And that's really the guiding principle for all of us at the White House and across the administration who work on AI. Um, we know that AI has the potential to bring enormous benefit, but we really must first deal with the risks. And those risks are serious. Um, it can increase cybersecurity threats, facilitate scams, targeting seniors, produce uh, contribute to online harassment, which endangers safety. 
and security. AI is already criminal justice, lending, housing, hiring, and education, which threatens core civil rights. And AI can reveal personal information in ways that we haven't yet experienced, which can further erode privacy. So models that leak or inferences that are not obvious to individuals who might be sharing information that they view to be really innocuous. AI is also dramatically increasing the ability to create realistic looking but fake images, text, video, audio, the proliferation of which can jeopardize truth, trust, and democracy. And finally, you know, there are questions about how AI is going to reorganize work. Is it going to displace workers? Is it going to inequitably concentrate economic gains? And how is that overall going to affect the jobs and the economy? So the Biden-Harris administration has been leading on mitigating these risks since long before the newest generation of AI, generative AI products. Um, we've met with hundreds of leaders across civil society, academia, and industry to help shape an approach toward AI that centers people's rights and safety. Um, and I'll be happy to talk kind of more about the activities that we've engaged in so far, but being very cognizant of the fact that I'm the big talking head, um, I'm going to pause and, and turn it over to some of my uh, panelists. Thanks very much, Deirdre. Um, Leonardo. Levels of excitement, levels of worry. Okay, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It's a real great honor. Thank you, Julie, for thinking of me for this panel. And um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here with Carolina, who is one of the big, big experts on data protection in the European Commission for many years now. And thank you, James, as well, for moderating this panel. So. This AI regulation is a new adventure, dear colleagues. This is something completely new, different from data protection. It has some implications for data protection, but it's a new field. And therefore, from the EDPS, we are extremely excited about the opportunity to shape this regulation to, in, a, in a way that will really make this technology beneficial for humankind. I don't know if you know that the EDPS will get the competences as AI regulator for the EU institutions and bodies, and perhaps for some other European matters that still needs to be figured out during the negotiations that will start in, in June. At the EDPS, we have already set up a task force to work on these things. Everybody's setting up task forces today. And we have already requested the first resources to the budgetary authority of the EU to start working on that. So what do we know about uh, AI regulation? Well, we know very little because this is a new field and we are all learning as we speak. If you want to know what I think about it, I invite you to read the article, I, the column I will be publishing tomorrow in El País where I will say a few ideas about how AI regulation should look like, but everything is very tentative at this moment. We do know a few things that I will share with you now, and I hope it will spark some debate among, among all of us. So we know that we need good legislation, and we need it quick, because technology doesn't wait, and, to, and the regulation has to come quick. This legislation should be straightforward, clear, easy to implement. Otherwise, it is very difficult to get the benefits from the legislation. Let's hope we will not end up with, I don't know, 200 recitals like in the GDPR, because this is not a good legislation. It has to be better. We also need a strong supervision, very strong supervision, because here, People's lives are at stake. This is no joke. So it has to be a strong supervisor everywhere. We need international standards because we cannot repeat the mistakes we made in the past. We don't want to have Schrems as scenarios in AI regulation in the future. We have to do better. We have to coordinate better in, between like-minded countries. We need companies that take more seriously the protection of individuals that it was the case with data protection and privacy. I don't need to tell you that 
Now, it's only now, after five years, that some companies are starting to realize the importance of data protection. We cannot afford this kind of behavior when coming to AI. And we also need data protection authorities that engage constructively with this new technology, not from a technophobic approach, but rather to complement the, these new regulations and to find workable solutions for for everybody. So I think I, I, I said enough for an introduction, so I stop now. Thank you. Thanks, Leonardo. Uh, Carolina, what do you think? Well, um, thank you. Um, indeed, thank you very much for having me, for the invitation. This incredibly kind words, Leonardo. It's a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, let me develop on what uh, uh, Leonardo uh, started to speak to start with a reassurance, so far our proposal for artificial intelligence regulation has only 89 recitals. So maybe we will not move to 200, but I'm afraid there will be some more uh, which are coming in during the legislative process. Indeed, we, in, in, in the area of, uh, of this very incredibly fast-moving developments, technological developments, there is always a challenge how to balance between the need to frame the, develop, the development, the innovation, not to stifle it, how to um, preserve the values, while indeed not stifling innovation and allowing uh, these developments to to rise to to come to being so um that uh, we can all uh, you know profit uh, from them is it possible or not well we tried and i think it's the, uh, the our artificial intelligence regulation it's the first worldwide uh, try on uh, on um, comprehensive regulation of artificial intelligence. Um, we, building on the experience we had while regulating processing of personal data, focused on technologically neutral, risk-based approach, which um, matches um, the need to um, protect or prohibit deployment of artificial intelligence in certain very targeted areas and moves um, the, 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 de the deployment use of artificial intelligence in a variety of areas to the so-called high risk. And here the whole discussion is should uh, for example, models as ChatGPT be moved into high risk or not, and I am, uh, and uh, my understanding is that uh, our legislators are, are reworking the so-called Annex Three of the Artificial Intelligence um, Draft or Proposal um, Regulation. So. Um, um, it must be possible, James. I don't think it's uh, we can uh, move into okay. We can allow ourselves adventures with um, such a, a powerful technology um, without having the assurance that uh, the values we stand up for will be protected. And um, well, I, I wouldn't like to repeat myself, but indeed, it seemed to us that the risk-based approach. Uh, with flexible tools allowing, the, in, in our case, the Commission to adopt delegated acts, updating the list of high-risk uh, um, users of artificial intelligence, is a way. Thank you very much, Carolina. We'll come back to, to the balance of risk and pace uh, moving forward. But, Julie, uh, Microsoft has backed OpenAI. Is this a big moment of celebration, or is it tinged with concern? So thank you, James. And of course, uh, thank you, uh, Leonardo, Carolina, and Deirdre for joining this panel. And thank you to CPDP for um, allowing us to have this conversation, because it's such an important moment uh, with respect to AI and what is happening both in the United States as well as in Europe. Um, I, I, I am deeply excited about AI and its potentials, and including generative AI. And I also have some thoughts about risks and the need to address them. Uh, one of the things I think that 
maybe I'm uniquely qualified to do at the moment is um, spend a little bit of time talking about some of the um, incredible opportunities that exist. Because I do think regulation is going to be necessary. I also think we already have regulation that needs to be enforced. But um, often these conversations James, as you know very well, um, because we've been in some of them before, often these conversations immediately talk about risks and leave out the opportunities. And I think it's really hard to develop appropriate balanced regulation if you aren't thinking about the full landscape. And I think both uh, Leonardo and Carolina have said that um, as well in different ways. So there are, we, we face in our uh, global society huge, huge challenges, whether it's around health care, climate change, feeding our population, better distribution of, um, of all of these things like health care, food, et cetera. Generative AI and AI generally will be extremely helpful in solving these problems. And I, we, we have lots of experiments that are underway within inside Microsoft, but we are by no means the only company that is dealing and trying to address these kinds of societal issues via AI. But I'll give you a few examples, again, knowing that there are many more out there. Um, there are one billion people on the planet that have accessibility issues, whether it's hearing, whether it's seeing, whether it's walking or, or um, other issues that they may have. Generative AI, as well as AI more generally, has been able to produce solutions for people who are either uh, deaf or blind so that they can navigate the world in a way that was impossible for them to do four years ago, five years ago, and 10 years ago. We happen to have a solution called Scene AI, which is a, an app that blind individuals are able to use that describes for them, it doesn't use names, it doesn't try to identify people, but it describes the scene that they are seeing. So there's a man who is smiling, there's a man who is frowning, or even leaving aside those emotional issues, just there's a man in the room who is speaking to you. Because imagine trying to navigate this world without that kind of information, constantly learning about what your environment is like because you can't see it. So again, it's just one of many examples. We call that, we happen to call that seeing AI. Another area that I think is really important to talk about, there are many of them, but in healthcare. Um, we, we have a real deficit in this world with respect to providers of healthcare. Um, ophthalmologists, just one example of many, many, many. There are 200,000 ophthalmologists in the world, the entire world. Think about how many of them are likely in the global south, and that's probably a very small number of that 200,000. Individuals have eye disease, they have uh, serious issues that can develop, whether they have diabetes or some other condition, without any way of anyone a, a, at any skill level being able to detect that they might have a problem with their scene that would actually cause them to go blind if it's untreated. Through AI, there is a way, through generative AI, there is a way to detect in a much more simple manner whether someone is on the path to developing one of these diseases. And with early interventions that might not require ophthalmologists in all cases, these are the kinds of interventions that can be, that can be dealt with. These are just two examples, but I wanted to give some granularity to them because there are people that really need solutions that we are currently unable to provide in our current society. The last thing that I'll mention is really um, for everybody in this audience, what generative AI will do for you all is provide productivity tools that will allow you to do your work much more quickly, get rid of the drudgery, and allow you to focus on the creativity that you want to focus on. So just as an example, um, Word. You all know Word or some, some Google, Google Docs or whatever. A, something that allows you to write a memo. You write a memo, and then you want to turn that memo into a PowerPoint. You'd give that to an assistant, or you would sit down and do that, and that would take a while to do. With a couple of buttons, 
in the context of generative AI, you can immediately take a memo and turn it into a PowerPoint. And you want to adjust it, you can adjust it too. And you can go the other way. And this goes on and on and on. You can look at an Excel spreadsheet, stick some generative AI um, analysis on top of it, and it can define for you the reason why profits have gone up or have gone down. It could help identify where the issues are that you should be looking more closely at. It's just these, these productivity tools are, in my view, truly amazing. So we call this the democratization of AI. And what that does is it, it allows everyone to have the ability to enable and power themselves by using these kinds of tools. Now the other thing about AI that I'll just mention, and then I know we need to uh, uh, get into more discussion, in many ways AI is an amplifier. It's an amplifier of issues that we are already facing. Deirdre mentioned disinformation, she mentioned scams, she mentioned a whole bunch of other issues which are real and definitely need to be addressed. Um, and probably we are gonna need to pay even more attention to some of those issues as AI rolls out. But these are issues we already have. Sadly, we have discrimination and bias in the world. We also have laws that address them, but we're gonna have to pay even more attention as AI rolls out more. So I, I actually am very, very optimistic. If we approach AI in a responsible way, if we really understand the benefits and the risks, and the risks have already been talked about, and I deeply agree that we need to address those, I think that we can move forward in a way that will truly advance society. Um, in almost a way that it's really hard for us to actually imagine today. Thank you very much, Julie. Uh, right, uh, colleagues in the audience, we need just to get a sense of the room. Could you raise your hand, please, if you're excited about where this is going, where, if that's your predominant emotion? Predominant emotion, that's, that's quite a few. That's good. Now, uh, we need someone in a second to come forward and to uh, give in a couple of sentences why they're excited to just give that into the room. So who would like to volunteer? Can I have the hand of the volunteer? Yes, sir. Okay, so come to the mic. But while you're doing that, or the mic will come to you, let's go to those who are predominantly worried and concerned about where this is heading. Actually, not as many as I thought. Um, Again, we need a volunteer just in a couple of sentences. Who can give us a couple of sentences on why they're worried? Yes, please. If you could come, that would be we'll get a mic to you up there. That's great. Thank you. OK, uh, those who are in the middle, did anyone not put their hand up? Well, OK. All right, you're, you're hedging your bets, so we're not going to go there. Let, let's hear why you're excited. Uh I, I think there are more questions in the world than we can even imagine, and we have the ability to solve them in ways that humanity would never be able to solve on its own. So I think the problems are real, but our ability to solve problems is our greatest asset. And that this will take forward our ability to, to address problems at scale and speed in a yeah, way that, that never before. That's what I understand AI to be, is a problem-solving machine, just like human intelligence is a problem-solving machine. Yeah, great, and, and worries? Thank you. All right, worries. Um, I will actually stick to just one. Um, I think that we will be seeing a very high risk to democracy and freedom in general, just due to the fact that AI-generated material, whether it's written or images or both, um, will many times not be certifiable. So um, we won't know whether what we're reading in the press is real or not. And when these things can be published and can be manipulated in a way to turn the public opinion in a certain direction or not, I think that um, society as a whole, freedom as a whole, and democracy as a whole will be eroded to maybe a point that we really don't want to see. Thank you very much. Very, very well put, both of you. Uh, Actually, that's a great segue into, let, let's dive into some of these issues. And I wanted to turn back to uh, Deirdre from Washington. Deirdre, I mean, the US is famously politically polarized now. Uh, we have elections approaching in 2024, which promise to be extremely divisive. 
uh, disinformation is always a, a problem. How worried are you about that aspect of AI, the, the disinformation and division and polarization capabilities, and, and what do you think can be done about it? Sure. Um, so I think I want to start off just by saying the president has um, stated, you know, earlier this year, he talked about how AI can help deal with some very difficult challenges like disease and climate change. And the administration is working really closely with global partners, both emerging and established democracies to maximize AI's potential to tackle some of the world's toughest challenges, extreme weather, climate crisis, health diagnostics, drug discovery, food insecurity. And all of that though is being partnered with cooperation on research that encompasses privacy and security and promotes the responsible stewardship of trustworthy AI. Um, and I think these partnerships, like if we combine these two things, right, the possibilities and efforts to make sure things are kind of rights respecting and risk mitigating, we can really choose a path where AI is used to serve the public good. So on the kind of particular um, issues that are I'm either most worried about or I think that we ought to be focused on, including those that might be particularly important in the US, but I, would, I think um, you know, polarization, for example, is something that many societies across the globe are dealing with. Um, I think it's really important as we do this work we both, uh, many of us are kind of thinking about low probability potential future events that can cause significant harms, but it's really important to anchor the work in the present moment, right? And for the White House addressing the risk of fairness and equity, or so you asked about, you know, inequality in society, that is one of the best ways to protect against a potential future risk posed by a future iteration of a technology. And so understanding and mitigating the flaws in today's systems, such as when they demonstrate bias against female candidates when asked to sort a pool of resumes for hiring or disproportionately deny health care to black Americans, both examples of harms that have already been observed. Um, if we focus on those, we can reduce real harm to people today. And I believe begin the work of trying to future proof right, an environment that helps us address the risks that we don't yet know about, whether they're low probability or high. So figuring out how to effectively evaluate today's AI systems for safety, security, efficacy, privacy, all of these things, right, um, is really important to do both before they are opened up to the public so that we can reduce harm to people today, but it's also really important to help us understand how to do that with future AI systems. So um, on the, the specific issue of kind of polarization and misinformation, uh, our audience participant mentioned, you know, risk to democracy. And in the White House, we talk about those as risk to truth, trust, and democracy. And those are real, right? Um, Julie is absolutely correct. We have dealt with scams and misinformation and disinformation, um, you know, throughout our entire history, but there are ways in which AI is a game changer, right? It is dramatically increasing the ability to create very realistic looking, but fake images, text, video, audio, those same tools that are really useful when we're using them to aid our productivity in the workplace can also be really weaponized, right? So in a social and political environment in which facts are routinely disrupted, uh, disputed, um, generative AI adds a new wrinkle, right? Or at least a new capability to the wrinkle. And I think today people can quickly create things that appear incredibly realistic. And we had an example on Monday, there was a false report of an explosion at the Pentagon accompanied by an image that it's not completely definitively settled, but it, experts seem to think there's hints that it was AI generated. And this was followed by fake images claiming to show explosions at the White House, the false report and the image spread on Twitter during the morning reportedly causing a brief dip in the stock market. And 
one of the accounts spreading the fake images was using a kind of old school spoofing technique, which was they were impersonating a Bloomberg, Bloomberg news feed. Um, so creating kind of additional risk because people would view that as a trustworthy source, right? And so generative AI is definitely another toolkit to those seeking to kind of pollute the information environment. However, and I think this is something that we need to acknowledge, right? These sorts of things are always um, cat and mouse games. And we know that if we make some choices today, right, AI can actually be really useful in identifying misinformation and identifying the actual images that AI is generating. And we need the private sector to be as committed to building those mitigation tools as they are to generating new capabilities and faster models. And that is why I, um, you know, we, we talked, a, we've heard a little bit about the um, AI Act already. And I do wanna just kind of offer that, you know, the US government has already taken considerable steps to try to promote responsible innovation and risk mitigation in AI in a very tight coupling. So this includes the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights that we released last fall that outlines five core protections that automated systems such as AI should include. These will sound familiar to people who are you know, steeped in the GDPR. They should be safe and effective. They should protect against algorithmic discrimination. They should respect privacy. They should ensure notice and explanation. And there should be human alternatives to AI, right? Those fallbacks that we know people are gonna need when things don't work as planned. Um, and at a time of rapid innovation, it's really essential that we state the values that we're seeking to advance and the common sense rights we wanna protect as we also articulate a strategic vision, right? We can use AI in lots of different ways, but our strategic choices about how we wanna invest as governments where we want to kind of like set the goal, I think is also an incredibly component, important component of this. And so in addition to additional things focused on risk, right, we have an AI risk management framework. We've heard a lot already this morning about the importance of like emphasizing risk and really thinking um, critically about where we need to intervene in relationship to the risks different things posed. Um, and we've also, uh, President Biden signed an executive order that directs federal agencies to root out bias in the design and use of their two new technologies, which is similar to the ways in which um, both the EU and the US with respect to the government require privacy people to be influencing design and technical choices. This is the first time we're gonna have civil rights officers in that room too. And I think that's incredibly important when we think about some of the real life harms that we know these systems have produced. And to just double down on Julie's point, I think sometimes people think AI is in some lawless zone and it isn't. Right. And last month, four leading enforcement agencies in the US issued a joint statement underscoring their collective commitments to leverage their existing legal authorities to protect the American people from AI related harms. And many of our most important consumer and civil rights protections, they both apply to these new technologies and our enforcement agencies are totally on the beat. So I would love to talk some more about some of the other initiatives that we have going on here, but I thought those were all important things to flag given um, the conversation to date. Thank you very much, Didra. Just to follow on, I mean, the US is in a strategic competition with China. Uh, command of AI is clearly high on the agenda, uh, staying ahead on that as part of that competition. How does that impact some of the choices you, you're describing between trying to make sure that AI is developed in a very responsible way, um, but at the same time, in the context of that competition, there's, there's a race on, and in races, things get uh, sacrificed. How do you see that? Yeah, so I wanna start with like the big picture. And I think we need to say that regardless of the technical landscape, whether it's AI or spyware or anything else, 
Um, we need to make sure that we are addressing these issues in ways that are consistent with democracies and that we, as Secretary Blinken said at the Summit for Democracy, um, we are really uh, centering right, rights and democratic values, no matter what the technology is that we are approaching. And we are seeking to build not just our own approach, but also to you know, work collaboratively with countries, democracies across the globe to also ensure technology develops in that right respecting preservation of democracies and democratic institutions way. Now, with respect to what does it mean for national power and strategic competition via vis-a-vis -vis China, I would say today the organizations developing the world's most powerful AI systems are American and they reflect American values. And we are seeking to make sure that those values, which are also you know, democratic values, are core to the ways in which they are thinking about the approaches of this technology, which is why it's so important to engage and why it's important that Julie is here on the stage with us as well. I think our charge is to usher in a new wave of the digital revolution, one that ensures that emerging technologies like AI work for, not against our democracies and our national security. And the US is gonna to continue to push forward both private and public investment in AI and public, sorry, in AI, and um, reflecting the recognition of the importance of these emerging technologies, the importance of getting these things right, and while we know China is making large investments in AI reflected in their contributions to academic journals and the growing number of graduates in this field, um, we are competing with China on multiple dimensions, but we are not looking for confrontation or conflict, right? We're looking to manage competition responsibly and seeking to work together with China where we can. However, what's of primary importance is investing in our strengths, our innovation ecosystem, and assuring that Americans can effectively harness the benefits of AI for societal good, economic competitiveness, national security, and do so in a way that keeps our democratic values at the forefront. Thanks, Deidre. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back to some of those issues as we expand the discussion. Leonardo, um, I mean, you said AI in this form is something new and requires, uh, to a degree, uh, a new approach, a new drive. And I was struck by the focus on risk uh, and uh, try to keep it simple and uh, compare the comparison with GDPR. But what does this do to the concept of privacy? I mean, we've got machines now which can analyze, uh, in the case of, of one of the, the tools, 75,000 words in 20 seconds. And that's going to allow kind of very powerful merging and comparison of data sets to, to pluck out details and identify them. And, uh, that's just an example, but how do you see the, the concept of data privacy being challenged and, and what does that mean? Okay, but first of all, let me to correct a terrible mistake I, I made by not acknowledging Deirdre when in my introduction. That's the problem with the cyber world, that is like she was not there. I'm very sorry, Deirdre. I'm super happy that you, you're here joining the conversation because actually having a representative from the White House is super important here. So um, before I go to the difficult interface between um, AI and data protection, which I think probably everybody in the room will have a view about that. Let me tell you that um, I would like to refer to the fantastic speech that our previous supervisor, Giovanni Buttarelli, made back in 2018. In, uh, you could consider it some kind of farewell address he gave. I think, Julie, you were there. Carolina, I think you were there. The title of the speech, which uh, is Choose Humanity, and uh, it's, it's fantastic, it's, it's online, you please go and, and, and listen to it. And there, Giovanni said something that I think, the more we advance, the more relevant it is. And he, he said, not everything that is possible should be legal. And not everything that is even legal should happen. And I think this is, I think, for me, it's crucial for AI. We, we have to let AI to 
run and to have all these benefits that uh, will bring to humanity, choose humanity. But at the same time, we have to be conscious that some things cannot happen. And I think this link with the question you, you put to Deirdre about this race, supposed race, with China and, and things like that. And, and on that, I would like to give something I, I often say when I speak in public. You know that um, Waterloo, huh? the battlefield, is not far from here. Huh? You can, if, if you come from a, far away and you would like to visit, it's just 20 minutes. And it's fascinating. So you go there to the battlefield of, of Waterloo and you know who won and who, lo who lost in Waterloo. Uh, that and, sounds, yeah. <laughs> yeah? So it's, it's, that was before the European Union, right? So the, the, the amazing thing about it is that um, the French army was better, much better. They have more troops, they have more cannons, and they had the best general ever, Napoleon. I mean, Napoleon defeated everybody in, in 20, 15 years. However, Wellington won the day. Why? Because he chose the land. He chose where to fight the battle. And then with the less troops and less cannons he had, he was fighting in his territory where he wanted, and he won the day. So if we want to win in this race, we have to fight the battle in our land, which is the land of the human-centric approach to technologies. And if we stick to that, we will win this race for sure. And on that, I don't think there is any significant differences between Europe and the United States because I think we share the same values and principles. That's why I think on this, on AI, I think we should really look eye to eye, US and, and, and Europe, to find common ground, because we know there will be others that we will, will want to use AI for other things, things that are not okay for our countries. So I, that's why I said before, let's avoid by all means the Schrems scenarios, please, with, with AI in the future. Now, coming to your question. Uh, is data protection, GDPR, uh, compatible with, um, with AI? Yes, provided that we engage on a constructive and innovative way. If we are gonna apply the GDPR with a completely narrow-minded 80s approach, is not one gonna work out. Because some of the principles of the GDPR come from the Data Protection Directive, which was enacted and negotiated in the 80s. And these principles have continued there, and now they are now in the GDPR. So we have to read them and apply them in 2023. And I think this is a challenge for data protection authorities, but we will have to do it. Because otherwise, I think, we will be not doing our job properly, which is to, to have data protection as an enabler for, for new technologies and not as an obstacle. Having said that, I come back to, to my starting point. Giovanni said it, there are some things that even being legal should not happen. And we should not be afraid of banning and prohibiting those things that are unacceptable. And for that, we need a strong supervision and we need big powers and resources so we can st stand up and stop some un unjustified uses of AI. And, and do you see big powers and resources as compatible with driving innovation uh, totally. on your own territory? Totally. I, I'm, I'm very sorry, James, but this dichotomy of uh, data protection and innovation I'm sorry, I cannot accept that. I've been hearing this for, for many, many, many years, and this only applies when you approach data protection with a narrow mind. Mm. If you read the GDPR as it should be read on the principles of risk-based approach, accountability, data protection by design, and things like that, is absolutely flexible. But of course, if you want to read it in another way, which was not the spirit of the GDPR, then things these things uh, become more difficult. Thanks, Leonardo. Uh, Carolina, let's extend that, that conversation. How do you see this uh, development of generative AI 
impacting on the the context for the kind of legislation we need the the kind of approach we we need to build to to, to preserve fundamental rights whether that's uh, data rights or rights beyond that um, well I, I think um, it will be a little bit difficult to add to what I said before what we chose is this risk-based approach based on what are you going to use the artificial intelligence solutions for? And I think when we will start to, to, to think about artificial intelligence regulation as uh, product safety uh, legislation, what it is, it will, um, it will maybe, as Leonardo referred to, to it, bring the whole discussion on the territory in which we want to move. So. Um, um, well, um, uh, Julie said, well, uh, actually, all these problems, we had them already. Yes, the problem is the artificial intelligence amplifies them. So the question is, how should we design the legislation so that we diminish the amplification of the problems we had before? And that these problems, just because the tool is so, of such a magnitude or such a power does not cause more disinformation, more inequality, and more um, and more uh, discrimination. So more unfair, um, unfairness, um, and indeed, how to match it with still not stifling innovation, not saying or um, well, um, not precluding innovation which is maybe as such neutral and the, the, the this is the for us uh, in the EU this was the big question where to draw the line and where to say well certain deployments should be excluded up uh, ex ante and this is what we really don't want to use. All the others are belonging to a certain group which should be checked more, subject to humor, oversight, monitoring, and so on. And some are left only to very strict transparency obligations. And transparency obligations which maybe needed to go beyond what we had as far as processing of personal data is concerned in the GDPR because there were this complex black boxes and difficulty for an individual to understand exactly what is going on. And here I would like to come back to, to, to your question on, well, a GDPR and AI, how does it work? AI as a product safety legislation applies across the board to all AI deployments, be it those which use personal data and which do not. So actually the two uh, legislative regimes, the, the, uh, the GDPR and the future artificial intelligence regulations will coexist complementing each other. Does it answer your question? It, it certainly <laughs> addresses my question. Uh, I think I, I want to just question you on another dichotomy just as a follow up. Okay. We, we talked about innovation versus regulation. What about productivity? I mean, one of the risks of, uh, if, if we get sort of, I mean, Leonardo said we, we need to try and avoid diverging approaches, which I think is extremely sensible. If we can, I, I s suspect that might not be fully possible. Let's see. I hope it can be. But, you know, if you can't have the deployment of certain uh, AI features or AI systems, there's going to be a productivity hit. Is that a dichotomy, or is, or is that real? You know. Well, let me maybe say what are the accept, unacceptable risks, which we really do not want to accept, and maybe um, maybe they would lead to a better productivity, but the price it's which we then would uh, uh, bear is the one we were willing to pay in the light of our values, social scoring. Uh, to start with, uh, clear threat to safety, livelihood, rights of people. So toys using voice assistance, encouraging the uh, dangerous behaviors of minors, and so on. Well, I don't know how to link it directly to increasing productivity, but this is something that we clearly do not want. And I think that any kind of regulation will always be faced with the argument, well, maybe you are excluding something that potentially could be good. But um, uh, there is um, 
there is a choice to be made and uh, standing up for certain values has a price and a price which is society we in the european union so, so we are ready to pay and uh, but on the other hand we we made an effort and we tried to find a way of really distilling exactly and balancing the situations where there are elements and situations that we want to pay the price of maybe reducing productivity i'm, I'm hypothetical i'm not sure the, what we excluded would have led to more productivity, and to distill and identify areas that could be good, could be bad, but we need to be very careful about them, and we want to retain full control ex ante about how they how is it going to develop. This is um, is it? I mean, any kind of framing excludes something. The question is, uh, what? and uh, whether it mirrors what we stand up for. And um, of course, I will say that our proposal does mirror what we stand up for. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> can Caroline. I say? Thank you very much. Uh, Julie, I mean, uh, despite um, the efforts that uh, regulators are gonna put into this, quite a lot of people think this technology is moving so quickly, so exponentially, that it's gonna be out there and very hard to put back in the box. Um, for example, by the way, it's being open sourced as well at speed um, and the development costs as with all new technologies will come down. What do you think this changes for major private sector actors for the big platforms? How does it shift? Do you feel new responsibilities? Are there going to have to be new roles, new principles you're going to have to absorb uh, as you try and be a responsible actor on this? Thanks, James. It's such a good question. Um, the quick answer is absolutely yes. Um, you know, AI has been around for a little while. I mean, as I said, generative AI is sort of um, causing a lot of euphoria as well as angst appropriately. But we have had systems for dealing with AI, at least at Microsoft. I mean, we have recently put out to the public to review our internal standard for how we approach testing, measurement, and other engineering approaches to ensuring that AI systems are safe, not biased, et cetera. This is our, the second iteration of our standard. Um, so we've had one for several years. We have teams internally that engage in testing, measurement, uh, uh, socio-ethnic um, uh, uh, evaluation of different outcomes for different groups. Um, we've, you know, for those of you who do cybersecurity, we have red teaming, we've got blue teaming. We've got a lot of um, systems in place internally to ensure that what we're doing is not just uh, the way we um, uh, phrase it, in, uh, to paraphrase Leonardo, um, we say, uh, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. It's a little bit shorter than Giov uh, Giovanni's uh, uh, formula. And so we're constantly looking at, should we be doing this? Should we be doing that? That is what responsible companies do and must do in the absence of regulation and in the absence of um, other requirements that might be placed on them by governments. I'll get to the government stuff either now or in a later question, but if I can just give a couple of examples because I think the examples are important so people can understand what it means to be a responsible company in this space. So a couple of uh, uh, areas where we decided uh, certain products did not meet our values, did not meet what we considered to be democratic values, or we changed our approach to how we offer them. So there's something called um, synthetic voice. Um, it's actually completely remarkable. Uh, uh, I, I have not yet put my voice through the system just because I haven't had time, because it takes some time to train the system in your voice. But once you do that, 
I could stand up here. I could be like Carolina, who speaks five languages fluently. Um, I know she didn't want me to say that, but it's true. Um, and I could be speaking to you in English, and then the, the AI app would be able to say the exact same words, which are coming right off the top of my head, in whatever language that I chose. I mean, it's truly, truly amazing. The other thing that the synthetic voice system can do for companies, so a lot of companies have like an actor or an actress that has that's associated with their product. In the United States, for those of you who are American, there's an insurance company that has a character called Flo. And she's actually a comedian, but uh, she's very associated with this particular insurance company. And so that company wanted to create um, a chatbot for its consumers who are calling in with the voice of Flo. So that it would sort of identify and it's sort of a marketing thing. Seems benign and fun and whatever. I may, some of you may think silly, but you know, it was something that they wanted to do. Now imagine you take synthetic voice and instead of using it in that sort of benign context, what you do is you use it to uh, synthetically uh, imitate van der Leyen's voice or President Biden's voice or someone else's voice giving a speech saying things that they would never say, and that could cause a tremendous amount of harm. So synthetic voice, very powerful tool, could be very innovative and, and wonderful, and can also cause real harm back to the speaker earlier from the audience, and really uh, be threats to democracy if, if truly used inappropriately. So we put guardrails around who we would provide this technology to, and under what circumstances. Most importantly, requiring a very robust consent mechanism from the persons whose voice was going to be used. Another, so just, I mean, so that's the kind of system that we put in place. We test it, we think about it, we red team it, and then we decide what are the guardrails we need to put in place. I wanna give one other example, just again, about what it is the companies really need to do as they're developing these systems. Um, so uh, we, uh, uh, sorry, I'm just um, having a blank on what this example is for a second. Uh, uh, it'll come to me. We, we, we do these kinds of things um, a, a tremendous amount. Um, it, had a know, it was a know your customer example. Sorry guys, three hours sleep and jet lag. It's not coming to me right now. <laughs> That's <laughs> but it, it will come to me. But the, these are the kinds of things that companies need to do. You need to set up internal standards. You need to have engineering teams that understand what they're supposed to do and not supposed to do. You have to be willing to put guardrails around it. I actually remembered the example now. You have to be willing to put guardrails around it. And sometimes you need to be able to say, no, we're not going to do something. So it was behavior, it was emotion detection in a facial recognition system. Emotion detection can be very helpful, as I mentioned, you know, with not identifying a person in seeing AI, it's sort of helpful if someone understands is that person smiling or not smiling. But when you're identifying someone and saying this person is smiling, this person, and not just smiling, but they are happy or they are sad. So you're not just expressing what their face is doing, but you're actually interpreting what that facial movement means. What we discovered by testing uh, this uh, system quite deeply was that the system was not appropriately identifying the underlying emotion in certain ethnic groups. It just didn't get it. It just wasn't, it, it had a bias to it. So we deprecated that solution. We don't provide it because we don't think that it is appropriately uh, non-discriminatory and unbiased and therefore should not be used in the world. So that's the kind of thing that I think companies need to do is just really, you know, are they, are they willing to tell their grandma or their Aunt Betty that they're selling that product in the world and that it's safe and it's appropriate? And if you can't answer that question, yes, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, but it's fair to say that many companies are and synthetic voice is out there. There's, uh, there's lots of examples of people doing that already and that's gonna spin out. Do you think corporate responsibility goes beyond what you know, for your, what your own company is doing, but I, I, are we going to end up in a kind of version of social media? Is this a publishing platform or is it just, I, you know, I'm just hosting the stuff? We definitely want to learn from the past, I think as a society, 
And when it comes to um, some of the concerns that people have around social media, we want to be able to say, no, we're going to actually address issues as early as we can. I think all of us have said we need to move quickly. And I think... Yes, there are always going to be irresponsible companies, just like we have now. We've got lots of irresponsible companies. And I think it's really important to understand something that we've mentioned before. There are laws that already exist with respect to scam artists, with respect to unfair practices, with respect to deception, and with respect to uh, employment discrimination and credit discrimination and housing discrimination. We can go on and on and on. But we do, I think, need to have additional rules in place when it comes to um, AI. We, you know, the, the um, EU AI Act has a lot of risk-based um, uh, requirements. That's going to be deeply important and could, I think, directly address synthetic voice as well as emotion detection. Um, the other thing that we need, and I, this hasn't really come up yet, and I just want to mention it because I think it's super important. So uh, some of you may know that before I was at Microsoft, I was a commissioner at the US Federal Trade Commission. And we dealt a lot with new technology at that time. This was during the Obama administration. And one of the things that I used to say back then was, you know, regulators were like five years behind business and um, industry when it came to technological development. And I felt that that was a huge gap and we needed to close it. I would say now, Regulators, they, they know about generative AI, but really understanding the tech stack and what it takes to produce generative AI and the layers at which the regulation should take place or not take place, I think is deeply complicated and something that regulators need to learn. The gap that used to be five years, that information gap, is now like six months to a year because that's how quickly companies are moving. And it's really a huge challenge, I think, for regulators. It's a huge challenge because of the speed. It's a huge challenge because of just understanding tech. I mean, getting into regulatory agencies, technological expertise is going to be a huge challenge over the next years. And it's not just technical expertise, but it's actually numbers of people. I mean, you really need to have like a team that is going to look at this because it's not like one person, uh, you know, as wonderful as a chief technology officer might be inside an agency, they need a team and they all need to be skilled. And there's going to be huge competition for this talent, huge competition. So I think there's a lot of challenges out there to get this regulation done well, to be in a balanced way and quickly. Thanks, Julie. Let's go to questions. Let's try and bring it. Who would like to come in with a question? We've had you. Uh, purple top, sir. <laughs> Thanks for a great talk. Ilya Vasilenko from VFOX. Uh, I would like to follow up on the last sentence you said. Um, it, there seems to be an imbalance between us humans trying to regulate AI that is playing in the same field as we of thinking, yeah, and speedy thinking. Uh, so do you think that regulators and legislators should increasingly use AI as well to govern it and to supervise it just to cope with the lack of human power uh, to do that. Uh, Carolina, uh, Leonardo, do you have plans to use AI to help your regulation? Are you adopting these tools yourself? A small deployment of ChatGPT to draft another act when we have already so many, not as far as I'm informed, no. No, we still do it very much by hand ourselves. I, I also fail to understand, uh, to, well, I would understand application maybe of certain legal norms which would be uh, straightforward or something. But uh, the design of the norms which should shape the artificial intelligence, this I would, I would really have a problem to understand how it would be possible how a system that should be regulated in um, designs itself, the regulation that should regulate and frame and bottom line cut down its possibilities uh, on its own, if I understood correctly the question. Do you, do you think that we can counter 
uh, AI with human effort with uh, very limited number of resources. And there is also adversary. I mean, they're also humans, yeah, but they will use AI and there is a lot of like synthetic data being used to mimic um, children. Yeah, and then try to call their parents and uh, enforce some payments and so on. Yeah, these cases already exist. Yeah, so we kind of need an another level of power to regulate maybe uh, or supervise or counter these all risks. Not humans against machines, but yeah. machines against machines. Uh, I don't think there should be any problem for public administrations or the EU to use responsible AI. On the contrary, I think is it should be our responsibility to make good use of the tools that we have to address our problems and to create public value. I think this goes without saying. This is, I mean, the same way that one day the European Commission decided to move from typing machines to computers. Well, we will have to move from uh, traditional computers to computers with some AI embedded. The opportunity we have is to do it leading by example. That will be something that we will try to do from the EDPS. So we will show the world that you can use these AI technologies and do it ethically, come in compliance with the law and things like that. But I, that's why I said we should avoid by all means, please, this technophobic approach towards AI. Technology per se is not bad or good. It's the use that you do about this technology that is bad or used. So if these technologies are used for the, for the good of humankind, not using them because someone may use them for bad, for bad reasons is really, a, really a shame. Let's avoid the loose, loose game by which companies decide not to, not to invest enough in protecting citizens and then regulate to start to punish the development. And then this, this is a loose, loose game. So let's persuade our business leaders to take this seriously and to invest. And let's persuade also the regulators to take a constructive approach to it. And then, then we will end up in a win-win game, clearly. That's some of the things we have learned with the GDPR for many years. And I think we should use these learnings for the new world of AI. Thank you. Let's take another question, please. Um, so you had your hands up first, oh, if I'm hey. looking directly at you there with the glasses just behind. Sorry, almost two glasses, sorry. With the, I've tried to avoid saying with the darker hair, but with the darker hair, because he was slightly first. Okay. So um, this question is picking up on a couple of things that Julie Brill said. Um, I very much agree that uh, organizations need to make decisions about what they should do, not just what they can do with this type of technology. And, and you talked about some, thing, some specific projects you decided not to do. What are the standards for making that decision? You mentioned, well, what would my grandmother say? That's out there and there's a role for that, but it's, it's very subjective. Then you have things like AI ethics principles, which are very high level. And again, in my view, don't really yield uh, operational decisions. Where else do you get standards? Um, is it a matter of process? Are there substantive areas that you look to? How does Microsoft do that? Uh, go ahead, Julie, but should that rest with Microsoft or go should government be setting these standards uh, or an ISO type body? Right. So um, I, that's that's where I was going to go. I mean, there there are standards uh, that are uh, being developed and and are actually out and uh, really important for responsible companies to look at. So NIST in the United States has created a really important risk framework uh, that does talk about testing. I think um, also I'll just mention that ISO is about to uh, approve an AI management standard, which is an AI management system standard, which is mirrored and based upon the privacy information management uh, uh, system. Uh, that ISO already um, adopted. I think the question is, though, a little bit deeper than that. So yes, governments and standards bodies do need 
um, to develop approaches that companies can rely on, and frankly, that they can be audited against, right? I mean, that's really the point, that in order to be trusted, in order for us, because you know we, we thrive at Microsoft when our companies, our customers thrive, and there a lot of them say, well, you know, are you living up to blah, blah, blah standard? And you know, that happens through auditing. So that's going to be a really important market-driven uh, approach to these issues. The other thing, though, about measurement that you're really getting at, like how do you tell? How do you tell that something is discriminatory? How do you tell that um, emotion detection is, is not working for certain groups? What that requires, at least inside of Microsoft, is you do need to try to create metrics around it, but you also really need to bring in experts from outside who understand the world in a way that you don't who are not necessarily engineers, but they're sociologists, they're linguists, they're ethnobiographers, they're people who can really bring in and infuse information that you might not necessarily have as an engineering company or a technology company. So I think that, that it's a great question, and yes, governments have a role, and, and the marketplace has a role in terms of auditing and measurement of, of certain practices, but at the end of the day, we need to widen our aperture so we bring in more information. We're not just making decisions based upon our own worldview. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Deirdre, we haven't spoken to you in a while. Do, do, you, do you have plans for standards to be set by, at federal level, or do you think that's for states? Does it change uh, between the state-federal the state -federal level balance on this kind of stuff in the states, do you think? Um, sure. I, I think um, that question, I'm sure, comes at least in part from the complexity of the privacy landscape in the U.S. where, um, you know, to understand it, you need to understand tort law, state legislation, federal legislation, the enforcement authorities of a variety of regulatory agencies, and it is a little bit more opaque until somebody kind of spells it out for you. So I, I do appreciate that question because of the kind of rich um, uh, uh, federated way in which the US tends to regulate. Um, so I think there are kind of two things I would add to the conversation that we've had so far. Um, one is, you know, for the administration, um, we thought it was really important to put out the blueprint, which says, here are risks and here are rights that have to drive your assessments. It's not any risks. It's not any rights. Like, here's a set of things, safety, efficacy, privacy, non-discrimination, right? These are core issues. And if you're going to do a risk assessment using the AI risk management framework or an ISO framework or whichever one it is you're going to use, it can't just be about any rights. It has to be about these ones that are kind of core um, to making sure that these tools serve the public and serve kind of democracies. Um, and while uh, there is you know, much work to do. AI is a tool, generative AI is a tool. It's gonna be deployed and is being deployed in a wide range of industrial sectors. And some of them have very different approaches to how they regulate for safety and efficacy and bias and how they like look at privacy. And so in the US, some of those frameworks provide incredibly like um, robust, both testing, verification, oversight, um, reporting. So you can think about kind of medical device, right? Where we have a lot of rules in place that are gonna govern how that thing rolls out in the world. And they are at the federal level. However, I would also point out that even when tools or interventions get an FDA stamp of approval, there is still kind of ongoing management in the field that is really important. And I think that sort of like understanding that risk can emerge over time, risk can change because the interaction between the drug or device and the environment or the particular population might change, right? 
I, I think some of those same issues when we think about managing the risks of AI have to be really front of mind, right? It's not just like, do we manage risks? It's when and where, and how do we kind of maintain that continuous oversight over these things, um, whether they're locked models or you know models that are evolving, we really need to be thinking about not just how we measure risk, how we test, but when, right? And and what are the conditions under which we we retest, for example? Um, we'll have to stop the there, other think, thing. Uh, Deirdre, we've oh. run out of time, but uh, thank you very very much. As you say, it's not how, but it's also when uh, as the question. I think we could carry on for much longer on this subject. Uh, you're definitely going to be discussing it here next year. Uh, I'd like just to thank our great panel for their comments and for their time uh, with uh, a round of applause. And thank you very much for sticking with it. <laughs> <laughs>